No Q and A, right? It's, it's in this. Yeah. Okay. Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyid al-Anam wa khatim al-Nabiyin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd. فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب العزيز بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والذين تبوأوا الدار والإيمان من قبلهم يحبون من هاجر إليهم ولا يجدون في صدورهم حاجة مما أوتوا ويؤثرون على أنفسهم ولو كان بهم خصاصة ومن يقشح نفسه فأولئك هم المفلحون وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم بادروا بالعمال فتنا كقطع الليل المظلم يصبح الرجل مؤمنا ويمسي كافرا أو يمسي مؤمنا ويصبح كافرا يبيع دينه بعرض من الدنيا أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام My respected young brothers and sisters Each one of us are in this world for a very limited time and none of us really actually know what, when this time expires. And in this time, we have to live, leave an imprint on this world, like the giants of the past. And I'm not talking just about changing the shoe size, or you know, getting a whole wardrobe of new sh- clothes, but a, a meaningful imprint in this world. And those people who that did it in the past were people who engaged in society, gave their time to society. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ made his companions do. He made them, involve them in the society. And they were ready for all aspects of work. And there are two components to our practice. One is our individual, our individual connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And second is our community service with the people around us. And on the day of judgment, the heaviest acts are those acts that you did for someone else. Those acts that you did to support someone or in the community. And that's the theme of tonight's discussion. Volunteering and activism in your community is so important. What it does, number one, is that when you help someone, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps you. The hadith of Prophet Sallallahu is, Wallahu fi awn al-abdi ma kana al-abdu fi awn akhi. That Allah consistently, constantly helps a person as long as they're helping someone else. The Prophet ﷺ, after Salat al-Fajr, he turns around, Fajr Salah, and he asks the, the, the congregation, he says, Man asbaha minkum sa'ima? Who's fasting today? Abu Bakr raises his hands. Then he says, Man asbaha min, min at'ama minkum mis, yawma miskina? Who has fed a hungry person? Abu Bakr says, I did. Third question, Man a'ada minkum al maridha who, is visit, who, who went to visit a sick person? Abu Bakr raises his hand. Keep in mind, this is Fajr. Then he says, Man atba' minkum al janaza. Who participated in a funeral? Abu Bakr raises his hands. All these four acts of virtue were done before Fajr time. Servicing the people. Being there for them. Servicing them. This was something that was embedded in the people of the past. Today we've become a community and a society of self-impression. We want to have an impact, but first be noticed. If we're not noticed for it, we're not going to do it. And that's not why we do things. It's self-impressed, self-marketed. you know, marketed. That's the social media world that we live in, selfie. Just, it's all about myself. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He appreciates your beauty, but your beauty has to give back to society. 
And that's where the Prophet ﷺ trained his companions. And the Prophet himself would serve the community. He would go around and help the people. In the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu an, the neighbor of Abu Bakr radiallahu an, Abu Bakr would go and milk their goat. When he became Khalifa, when he became the Khalifa, the girls in the house started to cry. And they came to Abu Bakr and Abu Bakr said, why are you crying? He said, because before you were an ordinary person, we could come up to you and ask you to milk our animal for us. Now you've become the leader, of the, like the governor. And your status has gone above our status. How can we expect you to come down to the status and milk our sheep for us? Abu Bakr says, I was doing this before, and the same Abu Bakr will continue to do it now. Meaning, I'm not changing myself for anyone else. Once, Umar was traveling and he was doing his rounds outside, which his protocol was that at night time he would walk around and make rounds outside of Medina just to see what's going on as a leader. And he noticed from far there was this camp of fire, smoke. And he comes close to this camp and he sees a lady stirring something in a pan. And ch- children, two, three children around her crying. So Umar comes disguising himself, not saying that I'm the Amir al-Mu'mineen or I'm the leader, the leader of the Muslims. He says, what's going on here? She says, we are travelers that could not make it before sunset to the city. So we are stopped outside and we're forced to camp. And then he asks, what's in the pan? And why are these kids crying? So the kids are crying because they're hungry and I'm weaning them and I'm trying to pretend that I'm cooking something so they'll cry and they'll fall asleep thinking that I have food for them but I have nothing but water in the pan. And you know when water is burnt on water, what happens? They evaporate. So really, they're not even going to get any water. Right? So we're just trying to pass some time so the kids feel like there's something being cooked. And then she says, Allah will question Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar about our state on the Day of Judgment. Not knowing that she was speaking to Umar. Umar said, how would he know? He says, how would Umar know about your state? You're outside of the city. He said, but he's in charge. And he's accountable for us. Umar anhu gets up with the student Aslam and he says, let's go. They head back to the city, town. They go to the Bayt al-Mal where the, the reserve of the Muslims and he brings barley, bread, butter, anything that's important for a family to eat for a few days that won't get spoiled. He brings that, puts it into a, in a bag, a heavy sack. And it was so heavy that he needed support to put it on his back. Once he got on his back, the, the young man who was with him, Aslam, said, allow me to carry this. And he said, no, I'm going to carry this because I'm accountable for it. He carries it to the place. He breaks up the bread, the meat. He puts it into the pan. Omar is doing this. He cooks the food. What does he do? The, leading, the leader of the Muslims, one third of the world, under, one third of the civilized world was under his control. One third of the civilized world was under his dictator. Dictatorship is a heavy word, but under his domain. And this great giant, Umar, he's such a powerful giant that the shaitan would not walk in the same street. The Prophet ﷺ said to Umar, مَا لَقِيَكَ الشَّيْطَانُ السَّالِكًا إِلَّا سَلَكَ الْجِنْ غَيْرَ فَجِّكَ If the shaitan walks on the same street and Umar is coming, the shaitan will run away. Dare walk the same street. It says about Umar, Ya man yara Umarahu taksuhu burdatuhu wa zaytu udumun lahu wal kuhu ma'wahu yahtazu kisra ala kursihi farakhan wal mulkurumu taqshahu. When the name of Umar was taken and the Roman emperor and the Persian emperor and the king in their walls would, when their name was taken in their kingdoms, their walls would shake out of the awe of Umar. Don't say Umar's name here. Don't say Umar's name. A young friend of mine a few weeks ago came up to me about a dream. He said, Sheikh, I saw this dream three nights in a row when I share it with you. I said, go ahead. Just like one of you guys, you know, like a college age youth. Good guy. You guys are all good. He comes. He says, Sheikh, I saw a dream. I said, go ahead, tell me. I said, I'm not going to interpret it. I just gave him the dream. He said, I saw a man 
he came up to me and he was asking me about someone and there was all these people sitting around and we were in a room or in a masjid all these people dressed up with turbans and long garbs they looked very like spiritual leaders and scholars and pious people with, you know I, and he started asking me about an individual and he mentioned the individual in the dream so that's personal but then as he was talking to this figure he's saying to this person he's like who are these people and I, he pointed at one person he said this is Abu Ubaid bin Jarrah this is Abu Bakr this is Uthman this is Ali and he started naming the names of Sahaba who were sitting around that gathering and Umar is saying that I'm, we're waiting for this person so the Prophet can come out when he comes we'll bring up so as this person is speaking in the dream to this person in the dream he's, he's a figure in the dream speaking to this person the person says, okay, you've told me everybody that's sitting on the wall, around the circle, who are you? The man says, Ana Umar. Ana? Umar. He said, the first time I saw this dream, when he said, Ana Umar, I am Umar, I woke up. In my dream, I got, I got scared, like, oh, standing in front of Umar. He said, I saw the dream again the next night. In the dream, he said, Umar again, he woke up. He was telling me that how intimidating it was to see. Knowing that he was Umar, he woke up in his dream. Can you imagine how powerful Umar was? One day, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari was saying in a hadith, that I was sitting, uh, he said, a jinn walked in, a jinn walked into the house of a sahabi. And he started doing mischief. So the sahabi got up to him, he said, hey, let's wrestle. Let's wrestle. So this jinn and the sahabi started wrestling. No joke, this is a real story. And he knocks him out, puts him on the back, taps him out. I don't know if there was a tap, I don't know how a jinn would tap out. <laughs> like, <laughs> a little bit of smoke. He taps out. It's just figurative, please. You know, but I like the creativity in you. Um, he, he's like, you know what, that was an accident. Let's do this again. Boom. Wrestles a second time, takes him down. He's like that. Man. You can, I mean, one more time. Third time. So uh, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari is leaning against a wall and he's teaching his students about this person, right? He's just telling them the story. And then the students say, Man huwa ya Abu Musa? Oh Abu Musa, who is this person that challenged a jinn? Abu Musa, took off, he got his back off the wall. He said, who else could it be other than Umar? This giant. He is serving this family. He puts the bread, the food, the butter, all this together, and Aslam says the, the smoke of the, the meat and the food was ripping through the thick beard of Umar. Then Umar fed the children food. And as they were eating, Umar went back and started watching from distance. And they, he, he was asked, why are you sitting here? You're done, your job, leave. He said, because on the day of judgment, Allah will ask me, Umar, this, this family, you witnessed they were hungry. What did you do for them? I want an answer that I can give back to Allah. That, oh Allah, I witnessed they were hungry and I served them. So I have a reply for the question of Allah SWT. And then he tells the family that's outside, that when you come to Medina, when you come to meet the Amir al-Mu'mineen, you will find me there. That was the nature of leadership. This is why the Prophet ﷺ says, Sayyidul Qawmi fi safari khadimuhum. Leadership is in service. It's not in ordering. Do this and do that. It's not in dictating. And part of strategizing is to kind of control the direction. But you can't just tell people what to do and not involve yourself. The Prophet ﷺ was the most involved person. They say when he came to Quba, he was the man picking up the bricks for the masjid. The greatest human. So my young brothers and sisters, America is a community that we are, where we live in a community that we are 1% Muslims in the United States of America. If we keep our Islam within the walls of the masjid, the non-Muslim community will never know about us. And the only way you can express your Islam and your sisters is very powerful because they literally identify Islam very clearly just because of their scarves. They know, you can't hide your Islam. When you walk and you carry needy people or you help people for any cause, they know you're representing Islam. And that is complete da'wah. A true story of my house and I conclude. I moved into a neighborhood last year in November, complete redneck. Um, Republican, Trump, sign, Trump supporter signs all over the lawns. 
talking about November. What was last November? Astaghfirullah, Trump got elected, right? <laughs> so, and I'm, I'm, moved, I'm moving into this neighborhood, and I'm like, but that's the cheapest house I found, right? <laughs> I mean, what's the amount I'm going to buy? You know, a simple house. So, I moved into this neighborhood, and there are all these Republicans, and I was scared for my life and my children's life. But you know, I was like, we're going to move in. I'm like, Allah is our protector. Nevertheless, I moved in. And um, I was, I think I was in Dallas that weekend, or I was out of state. And my wife told me that the neighbors, so I have my two children, boys that go outside, and my daughter really doesn't play outside, she's like seven months. But my, three, my two boys were five and four, they play on the lawn, and they go on the neighbor's lawn. You know, children are the easiest to kind of break the ice with neighbors. Even, they don't judge children, alhamdulillah. Right? And they were playing, and they noticed that the neighbor, the elderly figure, didn't come out of the house for a couple of days. So they told my, my wife, and my wife inquired when she was outside from the, the neighbor's wife, where is your husband? And they're elderly, they're talking like 60, 70 year old, retired. He said, my husband um, had a back surgery, was scheduled at Henry Ford, and he's in rehab, and he's gonna go through therapy, and he's not doing well, and medications, and drugs. It's like painkillers. So my wife found this out. This was the changing point. She went to the local store, bought flowers, bought a cake and a get well card. She wrote on the card a paragraph, whatever we're Muslims are supposed to do, like make dua for someone. She wrote a paragraph. She had the flowers in the hands of the kids, the cake in her hand, and they walked and rang the bell. This was the point of them melting. The neighbor next door was the developer of the entire neighborhood. The message went to the developer. The entire neighborhood now knows, and then, all of a sudden, my one day, I'm parking my car into my driveway, into the garage. The front neighbor comes up. He's like, "Hey, I saw you on local. I saw you on TV, uh, NBC, or some like uh, news channel." I was like, "What?" I was like, "So last month you were giving an interview, and he's like, you're the imam in our community, in the Muslim community, and you're my neighbor." And it just broke the ice, and it was all because noticing a non-Muslim was healing from a sickness. So when you step out of your comfort zone and go out to the non-Muslim society. In the way you're dressed and representing Islam, you give a total different impression of this. And that cannot be solved in the walls of this community, in the masjid. You know what they're watching? I met a, a pastor at a church. He said, he said, you know what, okay, I believe you're not a terrorist. You know what he said to me? He said, my parents are convinced that you're extremists. And he said, he said, when Muslims condemn terrorism, he said, they're false, they're just acting. Actually, I was on a flight one day, and somebody's like, and I was reading a book. So this uh, young man says, uh, excuse me, can I ask you a question? He's like, are you Muslim? I said, yeah. He said, if you don't mind, I have a few questions for you. And he's probably waiting to ask. I was like, we asked him, I was like, where are you going? He says, and I'm joining the Marines and in the Army. So you can imagine what type of questions are going to be related to this. And one of the questions he asked me, is like, I heard in your religion you are allowed to lie to non-Muslims. I'm like, maybe in Shias, right? Like, there is a, that, that there is a there is a there is a there is a opinion that there are lots of lies. I said in Sunni, like the to mainstream Islam, lying is a sin. And if you look in the concept of the Sahaba companions, that you will find mistakes, but they never found a mistake of them lying, because lying was something that was attributed to hypocrites. I was like, that's not that's false. So they don't know the right opinion. And your kind gesture, your community involvement, your service, your outreach, your volunteering with the community will change the rhetoric that's out there. And that can only happen if you come out of your comfort zone. And each one of you are, are a very powerful instrument for this. So I humbly request all of you young brothers and sisters, you are American, you live in this country, you have nowhere else to go. This is your place, this is your home. You need to somehow reach out to your Muslim neighbors and non-Muslim neighbors. Involve yourself, not just on blogs and social media and YouTube comments, but physically get out. Get to know, if all of us here volunteered on a monthly basis and got to know our non-Muslim community, it will make an immense change in our community and our society. Like this, you feel good about it. Allah rewards you. In the end, people also get the best, best impression. Your job is to make the effort. If the great Omar could do this, why can't you do it? Helping the people. And it's great reward. When you help people, Allah helps you. When you help people, Allah helps you. And the Prophet said, لا يح- لا يحتكم حتى يحب ما يحب You can never be a complete believer until you love for your Muslim brother or your sister what you love for yourself. That's so powerful. So I, I encourage you to all to um, have the ability and the zeal and the motivation to take your talent and 
tell the people about Islam. They're really, people are, don't know who, who you are. Right? And you could do this in a small, kind gesture. Trust me. So we all ready for this, inshallah? We're all going to keep involved, and inshallah, I like this youth of, um, um, gathering here, mashallah, this late at night, on Friday night, where you have so many other options of entertaining your nafs and your desires and your own time. But you sisters and you brothers came out. I really appreciate it. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to resurrect you on the day of judgment under those youth that were righteous. Say ameen. And accept your du'as. Make all your endeavors easy for you. Make you successful every step of your life. Um, keep you guys united. Support each other. My last advice is that always have a good friend that helps you become closer to Allah. You know, a friend that cares for you. And all the girls are like tapping each other. Only one guy tapped each other. Like, hugging each other. You know, like, and that's, that's, that's very, very important that we, um, we, st- we have a friend يمشي مع بك إلى الجنة A friend that walks you to Jannah And not only walks you to Jannah But he walks you towards Jannah And takes you all the way to paradise And that, that's a true friend Don't allow bad influence to take over you Don't allow that You're too precious for that So inshallah it's better to have one good friend Than ten friends that can wreck your future And wreck your akhirah So I thank you very much for taking out the time And making me feel so special I'm definitely going to remember um, this. I wish I could stay here longer and ask you guys what else I can talk about. If there's anyone has any questions, we're done. No questions? I think we're done. So inshallah, may Allah accept. And your sheikh, your young sheikh, may Allah reward you for all your efforts that you're doing. And may Allah bless him in his time and his knowledge. And take advantage of those who you have. So Allah can give you more inshallah. Jazakumullah khair.